There's a light in the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and it is brilliant as always to be joined by Joe Stanley. Hello Joe, Rachel hi. Finch and hi. Heinze. Good G'day to be legend. Hi to guys. Be it is lovely. It's a beautiful day and I want to remind you guys that Red Nose Day is coming up mm -hmm. this Friday yes. on the 9th of August. And did you know it's in its 31st year? It's an amazing event that's contributed to an 85 percent reduction in SIDS in Australia since it began nationally in 1988 and it's invested more than 17 million dollars uh, in li into life-saving research. So. That's exactly right Rach. People ask to don a red nose and be silly for a serious cause. Last year it raised almost one million dollars and they are aiming to beat that this year, Das. That's true, Heidi. So many people who work tirelessly to raise awareness and much needed funds for charities and we should pay great respect to uh, all the people in that space. Now one man I'm very much looking forward to catching up with giving a big pat on the bat is comedian actor all-round champion Shane Jacobs yes. is going to be dropping by <laughs> with his mum Jill to talk about Parkinson's disease and the great work that they're doing. Yeah Parkinson's affects more than 100,000 Australians and around 10 million people worldwide. It's the second most common neurological disease in this country after dementia and in most cases the cause remains a mystery. Nearly two years ago, 57-year-old Steve Watts noticed a few symptoms that became worrying. I felt uh, just a tingle in my uh, in my right hand to start off with, and um, you know, my wife, being a nurse, said to me that uh, you better go and get that checked out. Went to a neurologist, and then he basically just said to me, yeah, "You've got Parkinson's," and so that was um, a bit of a shock. It was also a shock for Steve's five children and his wife, Michelle. Michelle was pretty angry, I think, at the time, you know, and the kids are a little bit up and down with it. But, you know, we've just come together, I think, as a family to understand, OK, how do we move forward? What's our subject, Meg? History. Ooh. From there, it was about just researching it and finding out as much as I could about it, uh, you know, for my own and for my family's sort of sake. Although Steve's hand tremor is his main symptom, Parkinson's can affect people in many different ways. Your mouth dries out, your speech changes, you go a little bit husky and your voice tone and that might drop. All right, see ya. See ya. Have a good day. See ya. See ya. Bye. You do suffer uh, stress and anxiety with it. it. It increases. If I'm in a, a stressful situation, you'll find your tremor really gets going and um, and it can be simple stress, um, you know, so it does affect it. It's living with these symptoms that Steve has sought varying treatments. You know, you don't like to take medication, I guess, for just ad hoc, but simply for me, it was about the tremor and trying to reduce the severity of it. It's, it's helped and I've found a good balance, I think. Good. Try and get into the gym and, and exercise is really quite good. And been doing a bit of box exercise because it does help the hand-eye coordination and general fitness stuff. So that's something I need to, to keep up. Steve has been with the MFB for 34 years and up until he was diagnosed with Parkinson's was an operations commander. Responding to calls and getting to, to large fires as the incident controller now is something that I don't do. So, you know, that's sort of been a hard uh, pill to swallow, I guess, which for me was uh, really, I guess, difficult. You know, for me, coming off operations is a real blow, you know. 
you know, you like to do it probably under your own steam and, and not be forced into it. But at the end of the day, you, you have to realise hey, you take ownership of the situation, I guess, and say, OK, well, I think it's the best thing for me and best thing for the organisation, obviously, and the community. So you come to terms with it and, and finding other ways of going to work and, and contributing. So that's what I've been focused on. And the support of the MFB has been fantastic. Did Joe tell you about it bowling yesterday? Yeah. It's also been the support of his family that has got him through this tough time. We've always been pretty close, and seven of us, and uh, I think it's just put a new aspect on it, you know, put a different context on what we do now really putting what's important ahead of you because we don't know, I guess, what's ahead of us. You know, with Parkinson's, I think there's a degree of dementia can come with it. So I guess I'm sort of always looking out for that. That, that part of it does uh, concern me that you'd forget, you know, people, uh, particularly kids, yeah. So for now, Steve is focused on the present and getting the awareness of Parkinson's out there by being an ambassador for Parkinson's Victoria. You can't stay angry, I guess. You've just got to move on with it. Uh, there's no cure for it uh, currently, so it's about how we manage that. And uh, yeah, just reduce that stigma and, and get out of the closet, I guess, so to speak, so yeah. Oh, you can really see how affected he was by Sad, that fear it? of what the future might hold, mm. not knowing where it's going to end up, which must, must be really hard. Of course, Parkinson's has had a lot of publicity through celebrities such as Michael J. Fox and Billy Connolly being diagnosed and shining much-needed light on the condition. And those famous faces have helped highlight how much more needs to be done in the vital areas of research, education and funding. That's Darth. right, Joe. And after the break, one of our favourite homegrown celebrities will lend his voice to the cause as a comedian TV host and Kenny star Shane Jacobson drops by with his mum, Jill, and leading neurologist Dr Richard Blaze to tell us more. That's coming up next right here on The House of Wellness. Yeah, welcome back. Before the break, we looked at the nervous system disorder known as Parkinson's disease, which affects around 10 million people worldwide, Joe. And Parkinson's can hit anyone at any time, and there's currently still so much that remains unknown about the condition, including a cure. Joining us now, three people who are taking giant steps in a bid to help change that. Welcome the comedian, legend, all-round great guy, Shane Jacobson. Good on you, Shane. Thanks, mate. Sitting alongside your mum, Jill Goss, and leading neurologist, Dr Richard Blaze. So welcome to the three. Thanks for joining us in the House of Wellness. Yeah. Just for everyone watching, uh, so I'm not the neurologist. Everyone <laughs> that. Smart guy there. Clear that up early on. It's, it's important that you point that out. Yeah. Um, Jill, thank you very specially to you for coming in. I wanted to ask you, uh, how long have you had Parkinson's and how does it affect you on a day? daily basis? Um, I've had it for 17 years and I said to my neurologist the other day, not one tablet's changed in 17 years. I still take the eight tablets that I started with and I mm -hmm. take them now. Wow. And, and Shane, uh, yeah, we see you having a great time and a laugh and we all uh, love catching up with you, but how, how was it? You know, a close family, how emotional was it for you when you found out about your mum? Yeah, it, it was terrible, obviously, but uh, I mean, I mean, we've had these chats in many different situations where uh, you don't want to go, uh, why us? Because, uh, you know, life's not about going, well, if it's not us, who are you going to hand this to? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a great old expression, I don't know if it's true, but I kind of like it, which is I think it gets handed, some things get handed to the people who can deal with it, mm. and, and the strongest, one of the strongest characters, if not the strongest character in my life, is, is this yeah. lady right here, my mum. You know, some of us are lucky enough to have great mums. I'm very fortunate to have an awesome one. Mm -hmm. um, but look, mum, uh, the first, I think the first three or four days were for me, uh, a mum lives with it every day, but the, I remember the first four days, we, you know, you know one of four, <clears throat> and we, we really struggled with it. It was, mm. it was yeah. it, it, kind of the world stopped rotating uh, for, for a few days there. Um, but we tend to deal with things with humour. So uh, mum, I remember mum saying, really, that's all I get is four days. We started saying, you know, if you start shaking too much and you're having a bath, can we throw our dirty clothes? 
I thought, you know, we, we, you know, mum's like, what do we get? We get four days. Like, you know, because every time someone said, how's your mum, we'd all go, oh, you know. Yeah. So, oh, we tried all that. So that's they take me to the party so I can shake the martini. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it's kind of how we do it, you know. Because they, they say laughter's the best medicine. Mm. We all know it's not. Medicine's the best medicine. Mm. But, but mix it with laughter and, you know, it yeah. kind of gets you moving again. So, Richard, can you explain to us why do people get Parkinson's? What exactly is it and what are the early symptoms? Well, that's key to a lot of the research that's being uh, undertaken at the moment. We actually don't know why some people get Parkinson's disease. We know that it's probably a mix of people's genetic predisposition and, um, and then there might be environmental factors which play into it as well. So what kind of symptoms are we looking out for? I don't think it's overly helpful to look out for stuff okay. too much because you can be over vigilant. Right. Um, there, there are the classic motor features, which they're the physical things we see at the time of diagnosis, like tremor, a bit of slowness, some stiffness in the limbs. But actually, if you ask these patients about what's happened beforehand, you'll often find that they lost their smell 10, mm -hmm. 15, even 20 years before the diagnosis, or they developed some constipation or some abnormal sleep behaviours even. Having those things early in life doesn't mean you're going to get Parkinson's, mm -hmm. but they're all clues to the diagnosis. And it's a very complex disease with not only those motoric symptoms, but a lot of non-motor stuff as well. Mm. I remember, Mum, when we, we, when we first got the diagnosis, <clears throat> that you noticed that when you and, and David, my stepfather David, would go for walks on the beach, Mum would catch things. If she was on the beach with thongs on, she'd catch debris in one foot more. You know what mm. I mean? Like, drag a foot. Yeah. And, and the other thing I remember like missing a cup of tea with a spoon of sugar or, or just not being as accurate. Yeah. So there were little things like that. But I, I, again, I guess the point is, you know, if anyone's at home now watching the TV and they've just missed a cup, don't panic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're just a bad shot. We all have a bad day. <laughs> hey, Jill, you look fantastic. I mean, you've lived with this disease now for, for a number of years. Can you explain what it's like and what sort of quality of life you've had? Well, I have nightmares every night. I dream all the time. Yeah. There are always nightmares. And I think it's Parkinson's with you all the time. It never, mm. It's not a disease you can forget about. I won't think about it today because you've got to remember your tablets every four hours to take them. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to bed at night, you can't turn over. I've got a rod at the side of the bed that I try. Mm -hmm. You can't turn over. Um, loss of smell, um, not that that... It's a problem with men around. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's got us closer, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I've taught calisthenics since I was 16, mm. and this is the first year I haven't taught. I've mm. given it up. Uh. Um, I'm 78, and I felt it was time. I was an adjudicator. But I gave that up when I found out I had Parkinson. Mm. But I had adjudicated for 37 years. So my life's changed, but I've still got my calisthenics and the children, so that keeps yeah. me fit. So what kinds of support and services have been useful for you? What have you needed? Uh, well, my husband's my support. Yeah. Uh, he's a wonderful carer. Um, he said, don't forget to take your tablets. I said, well, don't you forget to tell me. Mm. <laughs> um, and that's the, been the best support with anyone. But I would say to anyone with Parkinson's to look for your support group because that is wonderful. The Parkinson's support group are wonderful. Mum was so good at so quickly becoming a part of a Parkinson's support group. And it's funny because... Well, it's not funny. It, it makes perfect sense because it's what Mum does. But she went into a support group and before you know it, Mum's involved in running the support yes. group. So <laughs> you were supposed to go there to get support <laughs> and Mum runs in there and goes, now, how can we help these people? It's like, well, hang on, they're supposed to help you, Mum. Well, there was only three people at the first meeting <laughs> and now we get 50... Uh, don't get 50, we get 30 to 40 at a mm. meeting. But the support groups are wonderful for anybody suffering. Mm. But, Mum, I remember you first telling me, that the, and, and it's, it would still be true today, is that when they go to these support groups, um, as much as I, you know, I, I brag about how brave Mum is with it, but it's still her journey. Like, you know, yeah. she makes us feel strong, but that's, that's her strength. But when she goes there, she finds out she's not alone. And that's what the Parkinson's walk 
mm. is all about, yeah. is finding out you're not alone and being in a room where you look into the eyes of everyone going, OK, well, they've got what I've got. Mm. But when you go home, even with, even with David there and family around you, I mean, it's a singular journey, really, mm. if we're honest yeah. about it. The family need to be there, but it's the individual um, that suffers, if you will. Having said that, Mum says, I don't suffer from Parkinson's, I just have it. But it doesn't have me, you know. Yeah. Um, but being in a group of people, and I think this would be true in any scenario in life, knowing you're not truly on your own and looking around and seeing 30, 40, 50 other people, and in the Parkinson's walk case, thousands of people turn up. And just, I mean, sport does it, family does it. I mean, that's how humans cohabitate. Yeah. Get into a group scenario and go, hey, we're in this together, and yeah. you stand a touch taller and feel a little bit more strength to, to move forward. And that's where Parkinson's Victoria, Parkinson's support groups and the Walk in the Park make a huge difference. Shane, you've been a uh, great uh, supporter of a Walk in the Park. How do we find out more about it if we want to get involved and support the, the Parkinson's community? How do we do it? Yeah, well, parkinsonswalker.org.au uh, is, is the website. Uh, it's, it's on Sunday the 18th. Uh, of August. It kicks off at Federation Square. Um, it's uh, a lot of my friends go, so you drag your mum for a massive walk. Gee, you're a great help. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, there's some there's some different length walks. Uh, you know, we're on top of that. Um, and it, look, it, it's a walk along the Yarra and, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, the team, it's the old thing, you know, the teams do travel as fast as their slowest member, um, which is usually our loved one that's got Parkinson's. But again, it's a great show of support and you don't have to have Parkinson's. If you want, it's, it's a great day out in Melbourne. Yep. Um, you know, the sun starts to come out enough in August that you should get out in amongst it and have a bit of a walk anyway. Um, but truly, at, at the start we get on stage and mum actually leads uh, the warm-up. Um, she does a bit of dancing on stage. That's yeah. the best. I have the best view to look out to those thousand people doing the warm-up that oh. my daughter always helps me with. Yeah, it's wonderful. So, Richard, in the meantime, I know that neurologists like yourself and organisations like Parkinson Victoria are providing amazing care and support for people living with Parkinson's. What sorts of advice can you give to those people? Well, I think one thing is to be very open and uh, communicative with your neurologist, and particularly if you can find one that um, specialises in Parkinson's or movement disorders, because it's quite a complex field now. But apart from that and sticking to your medications, it really comes back to those, um, those essential ingredients to leading a, a good life. It's sleeping well, eating well and exercise. And after you get the medications right, it becomes a lot more about those core things to keep patients well for a longer time. Interestingly, in Jill's case, that history of doing calisthenics has clearly held her in good stead because we recommend that all our patients do exercise to maintain their balance and their mobility, and Jill's obviously done extremely well with mm. that. Hey, Jill, today's not about uh, Shane, let's be honest. It's about, uh, about you, but your uh, son, this one, you've got four kids. He's grown up to be one of the most loved entertainers on Australian television. Is there something you don't know about him? Was he a particularly naughty young kid? Or <laughs> you, can you share something with us? I wasn't happy when he did the... Um show where they took their clothes. Oh, the, the full Monty. Monty. No. <laughs> oh, everybody else loves that, Well, Jill. I was disappointed in him too, Jill. I thought, yeah. he, I thought he let himself down. I think Mum said, I'm pretty sure when I made you, I gave you all the pieces you needed, yet one piece seemed to be missing. She's <laughs> <laughs> a great support, is Mum. She said, and you should have worn a support. Uh, <laughs> the Melbourne Walk in the Park is on Sunday, 18th of August, as Shane said, with uh, walks also happening across Victoria. So head to parkinsonswalk.org.au for more details. Shane, we can see where you get your humour and your talent <laughs> from your beautiful mum Jill and thanks to Dr uh, Richard Blaze for coming in today, really appreciate it. Thanks, well, guys. Thank great you. to catch up. Up next on the House of Wernos we're keeping it in the family, we meet two sisters who are in the driver's seat for reducing single use plastic. You're watching the House of Wellness. Single-use plastic is a major issue for our environment and with more and more products on the market, it's the variety and the convenience that makes us fall into bad habits, Heinze. Mm. Mate, I agree, Darth. And with apps making food being delivered to your door, such an oh. easy option, mm. it just creates more plastic containers and more packaging and therefore more guilt. It's incredible how much plastic comes. There's mm. one for the sauce, mm. there's one for the rice, there's one for the food. It kills me, Rachel. Right? Yeah. 
dumplings. I mean, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I try to, I, Is this a personal order job? <laughs> Is it on the way? <laughs> I try and do my best to order from places that I know use eco-friendly packaging, whether it's paper or mm -hmm. recycled products. But not everywhere does that, so it's, no. it's it's difficult. But at the same time, you know, you need we need to be doing the best that we can. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, what's a real trap is we go to the supermarket with our reusable bags, but then when we get there to the supermarket, we fill the bags with more plastic. Exactly. So when you think about the cleaning products, the shampoo, the conditioner, body wash, that's a lot of plastic you're taking home with you. Mm. Well, Joe, a couple of Melbourne sisters are tackling this problem head on with a mobile service to help save the planet from dreaded plastic. Take a look. Two women and a truck are helping to reduce plastic waste one refill at a time. Roving refills were started up by sisters Claudine and Raphael, who have set out to tackle the waste produced by buying cleaning products in single-use containers. Rather than racking up more plastic waste with each trip to the supermarket, you can bring your own reusable containers to Roving Refills to fill up on the go. Instead of just throwing that out and buying a whole new bottle, the idea is that you bring that empty bottle to us and refill it. Because what you're really essentially buying when you go to the shops is you're buying the shampoo. You don't really need another container. So that's what we're hoping to cut out, to cut out that disposable plastic each time. Some shampoo? Yes, please. OK, no worries. The peppermint or the rosemary? The rosemary, thanks. People bring all sorts of containers to the truck to refill, which is really quite entertaining. So we get your standard jars and, and empty shampoo bottles and what have you, which is fine. We also get some interesting ones, so some wine bottles, some empty vodka bottles we've had along, just kind of whatever's lying around people's houses. And that's the idea. I think it's a fabulous idea. We have so many plastic containers and we try to um, avoid using them, so it's good to be able to reuse them and refill our bottles. This concept looks a bit like the keep cup phenomenon on steroids, but the sisters were actually inspired by a different foodie movement. Right, so $11. I thought of the food truck model and how people are really getting on board food trucks. They follow their food truck around, you know, and I thought maybe they would do that for our business. And they have. With a variety of different cleaning products, including toxin-free soaps, detergents, shampoo, borax and vinegar, you'll be doing more for the environment than just reducing plastic waste. It's everything natural essential oils, so it's all environmentally friendly stuff. When it ends up in the waterways, which it will, it's not going to have any damage. The geranium is like a Castile soap. Is that like really watery? This one's a gel, so it's oh, thickened. Okay. Yeah. I really think we have a problem in the way our consumerism is set up. I think that the mainstream way of doing it is really damaging and it's become a, a really big habit, you know, for me too, for, for almost everyone, to go and buy what you need and then forget about it. I might have one, maybe that one was the more, like, the fancier one. Yeah, and that one was just the everyday yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've made all of these containers with natural resources from the earth, so why don't we keep using them, you know? So we're happy to refill whatever container you bring to us. <laughs> I love that idea, so good, don't you? Yeah. Just, I love the food truck model, and all you have to do is go to their website and find out where they're going to be, and don't forget, your BYO container. Mm. Mm. You need that before you leave the house. Great idea, isn't it, all around? One man has always uh, got a truckload of goodness and good ideas. He's none other than Gerald. Hello, Gerald. <laughs> Hello, Das. In fact, it's my truck's out the front. Quigley's Quirky Vitamin and Herb Mobile. Oh! Hey, I've got to say, can you tell me what your daily vitamin special is? Look, we're talking energy today, Heinzi, something that you seem to have a fair bit of. Yeah, well... So we're talking energy and the energy components of vitamin B. OK, I take a vitamin B. I'm not really sure. Someone said take a B12. That would be great for stress and energy. What are vitamin Bs and how do they work? Water-soluble group with similar names but completely different chemical structures which often come together as a package. But each one, interestingly, plays a role. So your B12, yep. good for memory, good for nerve function, yep. uh, good for recall. But there's others. B5, good for cholesterol management. B1, good for overall energy. B1 and B2. Now, look, I know you're listing them off, and I know that salmon and leafy greens, eggs, legumes, they're all great 
great sources of B vitamins. Yes. What other foods are they found in? Well, tr you've mentioned salmon, but trout is in there as well. Yep. Oysters, green leafy vegetables, fundamentally really important. Um, citrus fruits as well. So all of those things, and how often do we talk about sensible food options? So who would benefit from taking a B-complex? Well, I can speak from personal experience here. And, <laughs> and working with you, I need a B every day before Excuse I come. Excuse me, Gerald. And I find... So anyone who feels under the pump, um, stressed, <laughs> needs to concentrate, needs to perform mm -hmm. um, with you, then they, that's an obvious B-group person. So it really is good for any of us. Well, look, thanks, Gerald. The A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy, New Zealand's number one premium supplement brand, now available in Australia. Welcome back. I think most of us can identify the struggle of getting kids to brush their teeth and look after that part of their uh, oral hygiene, uh, Rach and Joe. Now, <laughs> if uh, you want to get a fight in my house yes. with the four of them, mm. if one uses the other's toothbrush, oh. it is seriously oh. World War III. So they write, well, that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> they write their name on their own toothbrush because there's four of them. Yeah. But even still, you'll get one that decides to use the other one's toothbrush, yeah. which it, doesn't go that down well. That is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Oh my God. It, is, it is a bit of a nightmare, um, yeah. but in my house, the best investment that I ever did make was purchasing a electric uh, Elsa themed toothbrush. Oh yeah. Oh, and I, like I, it fun. Good. I have no trouble at all. She loves pressing the button. Does it's it sing too... Let It Go? It doesn't sing okay. Let It Go, <laughs> but she sings Let It Go yeah. while she's brushing her teeth, <laughs> and she loves it. She loves getting in there and doing it. Yeah. And, and then Dom watches Violet, so monkey see, monkey do. So. Yeah. We always found that music helped, and I've been uh, brushing my teeth with Willow since she first started, and so now just habitually we do that every night, mm. and there's no issues whatsoever. Put some tunes on, time it to two and a half minutes. <laughs> How can we go? Come to your house. That sounds fun. That's the way we roll. <laughs> now, a married couple, Rachel and Justin Bernhardt, have made this everyday parent struggle into a very successful business. Let's take a look. We moved to New York in 2005. Five. Uh, to start careers as a photographers. The intensity of a city like New York, ironically, allowed us to focus on healthy living, and that became sort of even more a focus once we had our kids. It was after the birth of their second son that the financial crisis hit the photography industry, and Rachel, who was previously a dancer, and Justin, a pharmacist, had to look for a new career path. For me, the light bulb moment came when we noticed the first teeth coming through on Dali, and we went to Whole Foods and we bought a really expensive natural toothpaste, and he just pulled a face and spat it out, and we tried again and he started crying. And we sort of put two and two together and said, here we are in New York, we can't find anything that our son would allow us to brush his teeth with. Um, and we thought, if it doesn't exist in New York, then it doesn't exist anywhere. And we thought we'd give it a go. So the couple moved back to Melbourne and with Justin's pharmaceutical background, they looked at developing a natural kid's toothpaste under the name Jack and Jill, a brand that Justin's dad had bought in the 80s, but was no longer in production. So yeah, we, we basically dug out the old equipment, restored machines, got the machines going and made the first 50,000 tubes of toothpaste ourselves. The day after the first batch was ready was when disaster struck. The next door factory to ours had had a disastrous explosion and it blew a hole in our factory wall and shut us down for six months. We weren't even allowed to enter the premises. So we'd put all our pennies into, into that first run, so we, we had nothing left, did we? Mm. But miraculously, the machines and the product were saved and ready to take to market. And then we packed up a van and went up to Sydney and like two little country mice. And we went to Officeworks, we printed a banner, <laughs> we set up a little fold, fold up table. And it went really well. That first expo we got national distribution straight away, so it moved really quickly. After running the Jack and Jill brand from the front room of their house for the first three years, the company has now expanded with 20 employees and over 50 products in 50 countries. And now, their latest family brand, NF Co. Yeah, 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 no, it should be consistent, definitely. Yeah. Thinking and making toothpaste, we still, even for adults, couldn't find one that we felt was really spot on in terms of 
the experience of using it and how well it works as an alternative to a traditional toothpaste. So with NFCO, we wanted to make it the classic mint experience and it also foams and it's really high in xylitol, so it's an effective toothpaste as well. With an environmental focus, Justin and Rachel decided to make biodegradable toothbrushes from cornstarch. So after production, this is where the products are brought in for QC. And after Lots of people love the idea of eco and they want to support environmentally friendly products and brands, but if it doesn't behave in a traditional way that plastic behaves, then they have no patience whatsoever. So that's been one of our big challenges over the time. Not only is it good for the environment, but made locally. We like to be in control as much as possible of what we make. Very difficult to do that if you're outsourcing something from overseas. So as far as our brands are concerned, um, we really value the fact that they're Australian. Hey, toothpaste nerds. I'm all brushing dicks out there. And the boys are still a huge part of the company since its conception. We consciously have included our children in talking about the business and even in practical ways. We, we take them to expos. We use them in our social media posts. Yeah, because yeah. as parents, we feel like if they can develop confidence and resilience, they're two of the most important things we want them to develop. So we just, it, as we can, we can use the business for that. Stuff that looks a lot like plastic is actually corn. OK, bye! Jagger, you wreck Toothpaste and toothbrushes for too long have just been something that you try to hide away in your cupboard. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're generally not very cool. We like... Cool things. Beautiful things. <laughs> Yeah, what a great little story and how beautiful are these, the adults range, not only stylish but environmentally friendly, I mean, they're gorgeous. Super funky and look, four different colours, Dust, so your Hello. children would know <laughs> yes. which one is there. That, well, that solves a problem, <laughs> I'm uh, excited by that, they look very, very cool. Great idea, well done to those guys. Up next we find out how to keep our relationships sizzling, Ooh. but first, mm. Zoe turns up the heat. Savoury French toast right now in cafes is hot, but there's no reason why you can't recreate this dish at home with a little extra twist of nutrients. Now, I like to use sourdough. Sourdough contains B vitamins. It's also got really good sources of insoluble, soluble and resistant starch. And it's really simple. You just pop your bread into the egg wash and make sure it's absorbing into the bread. And then I'll pop this in the frying pan. I'm going to serve my French toast with these beautiful sautéed mushrooms. They're full of B vitamins, but they've got that lovely meaty texture, so they're a great alternative to meat. My spirulina parsley pesto is the crowning glory of this particular recipe. I love using parsley instead of basil. It goes so well with mushrooms. It's a big source of iron, vitamin K, but the flavour complements really, really beautifully. I've already got in my food processor walnuts, good fat. But the particular fat they've got is something called ALAs. This is quite hard to actually get in your diet. I have my lemon zest and I've also got a little bit of garlic and parmesan cheese. I'm adding spirulina to my pesto. It's got this amazing green colour because it's a blue-green algae and it's full of chlorophyll. It's got protein, it's got magnesium, manganese. I add spirulina to my juices, smoothies and I've even added it to a salad dressing. Once all your components are ready, put the mushrooms onto the bread, sprinkle with a little bit of the goat's cheese and then drizzle with your beautiful spirulina pesto. See, there you go. It's proof that French toast doesn't need to be sweet. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Well, the 80s rapper Salt and Pepper might have said it best, Joe. Let's talk about sex. Ooh, yes, yes. Let's. Ready? Now, Reference. look, it's no need to be embarrassed about this. Obviously, it's a healthy, very important part of any relationship, but sometimes, let's admit, it's totally normal if your partner and yours mojo doesn't quite match. Mm. You know, you might be in the mood and they're not, or vice versa. 
it happens. OK, mm. we're here to lift the covers on the topic of mismatched libidos. Welcome, couples therapists and sexologists. Asaya McKimmy. Asaya, welcome to you. Thank you so much. Let's begin by asking, what is a sexologist? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> so a sexologist is essentially someone who's studied human sexuality at a postgraduate level at university. So I'm a couples therapist, a sexologist and a sex therapist. So I help women and couples have more harmonious relationships, have wholehearted intimacy together and have loving sex. I've got to ask, what determines a person's level of libido? So there are so many factors that determine our libido. Libido is really contextual, so that means that it's impacted by things that are going on around us, our biology, our emotions and our psychology. We often think of libido as being spontaneous, as something that just arises, but we're actually now discovering that that isn't quite true. It's actually responsive. So it responds to different stimuli in our environment. We can think of it as having like brakes and accelerators, like a car. Yeah. So we need that in order to get the car driving, we need to take our foot off the brakes and put our foot on the accelerators. The accelerators wow. by themselves mm, just don't incredible. work. Mm. And as couples, like I think all of us can admit, none of our relationships are perfect. So our drive would be different at different times of the week. At, or mm. At different times of the week, at different times in, in our lives, really mm. depending on what's going on for us. What, are you, what advice do you give to a couple whose libidos are at different levels, clearly? Yeah, well, firstly, that it's really normal for this to happen in any relationship. And in heterosexual relationships, sometimes it's a male with higher libido, sometimes it's a female with higher libido, and both of those situations are really normal. What I would say to a couple is talk about it together and work on it together. So it can't just be seen as the problem of the person with the lower li libido. Yeah. It needs to be seen as an issue in the relationship and something that you work on together. Mm. I think as us women as well, you know, we've just got set markers throughout the month. Some days are great, some days are not so great. And I know personally, um, my husband, we've been together for 10 years, he's just picked up on the cues and the signs that, you know, it's great and I just need some space. I might give him a call, Rachel, to get uh, some advice. I'm sure I've quite worked that one out just yet. Um, so, uh, um, you mentioned the word normal. So I think the question would be, how, how many times a week, how many times, how many times a year is there a, is there a normal bracket for, uh, for a couple? So I don't put a number on this because I think it's really important that every couple works out together what it is that works for them. I think when we put numbers on it, we start to put pressure on ourselves mm. and we can start to feel inadequate, we can start to feel ashamed, or we can start to feel frustrated with our partner. So what's really important is that each couple works out what it is that works for them and know that they also might have to compromise and find ways to work together on this. I'm a bit of a numbers man aside. It's a competition, yeah, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, have, you, have you got get something a, written down? Well, Are you hoping that we could bring a scorecard? Or? You get some stats out, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you really oh. love stats, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if you've got some advice from couples that have been together for a long time. So I've been married with my, uh, my husband and I 20 years and I oh. say to him, mm. my advice is, that foreplay starts with the dishes, right? <laughs> oh, it really this. does. That's okay? attractive. It's attractive and I feel like he cares about me. We are connected <laughs> because I'm like, okay, now we're equals here. So just okay? do the dishes, that's it. Yeah. Well, that's simple. Simple. I know what you're okay. going to do tonight, Dar. It's a simple thing. <laughs> it's a simple act of kindness to me. So do you have other advice for people together a long time? Well, firstly, I want to say that that's really true for a lot of women. And we know that for couples who share household chores equally, that they have higher relationship satisfaction mm. and higher sexual satisfaction. I know, satisfaction. I read that. I left the article out of it. <laughs> <laughs> <the table. laughs> <Husband. laughs> so it's really important for women often that they feel relaxed and not too exhausted. So choosing your timing, a time that works for both you and your partner, becomes really important as well. And because women's sexuality particularly is contextual, again, all those other factors, feeling close and connected to our partner, feeling like we're a team, but also making sure that we're not just co-parents or co-managers of a household, that we still have fun and novelty and playfulness mm. in our relationship mm. also helps keep that spark alive. So we need to get you back for a longer chat, but I've got to get going to do the dishes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I will not be uh, missing that tonight, I promise you. But thanks so much. Very uh, interesting chat. More on the House of Wellness right after the break. <laughs>
Welcome back. Social media has become a massive part of our everyday lives, Joe. but is it adding extra stress? Well, it's recently been announced that Instagram followers in Australia will no longer be able to see how many likes someone's post has received under trial changes to remove pressure on the digital platform's users. So, Rach, I know that you're all over Instagram and I am not. Can you <laughs> explain to us how it works that you can see your likes but other people won't be able to see yeah. how many likes you've received? So, you've got access in your insights to tap on the people that have viewed your photo right reveal the likes you, you can show them share them how you will mm. um, but the public can't see them and I think this is an absolutely brilliant move from Instagram it takes away that pressure mm. that people feel particularly the younger generation to feel like they need this validation in the yeah. digital world I think it's fantastic too because actually um, what the social media companies the people that put these out there what they know they can do is manipulate our reward system in our yeah. brain. That's actually deliberate on their behalf Getting and it manipulates likes. young people to become really competitive and it's very damaging at a time when their brains are developing yeah. and they become addicted it's to that like reward system. It's like a drug hit when they oh, get that double terrible. tap. Mm. And the thing is, a lot of people were comparing, well, I did a photo of my face but my girlfriend at school did her photo of mm. her face and mm. why didn't she get that many likes yeah. and I didn't. I think for me, I use the likes as a bit of a barometer as to what people want to engage with. Mm. So I don't care who can see them or who can't, but what I see if I do a photo of food that they like, great. Sure. They like that, it's mm. a good sign to do more of that type of content. Yeah, and creative I think it also puts the emphasis back on the quality of the photos and the videos versus yeah. how many likes is it going oh, to get? Versus puppies, 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 which is all I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I follow you, Jim. Now, now, can you keep up to us? Because you don't even have Instagram. Well, do you know I what don't. We're I, about? I've missed the whole uh, boat completely. I don't have any uh, count or uh, my kids sort of laugh at me uh, consistently and think how embarrassing it would be if I didn't suddenly <laughs> decide to take it up. But a lot of the research now is around, you know, since the iPhone has come out and for the next generation, that the effect that it's having on youth is quite damaging, mental health and the anxiety and depression. It's, it's a big part of your guys' world. And, and do you feel always as though that there's some responsibility in what you... What Absolutely. You yeah. We grew up in a very different time. We didn't grow up with iPads and phones in our hand. The new generations are learning how to use these from really young ages. Mm. So if we can set a healthy limit of how much they use it, but also how it reflects how they feel, their mm. self-esteem, their self-worth. Mm. I mean, I mean, photo editing tools, all of that type of stuff. It's a slippery slope yeah. for young people who don't have the right guidance. Well, I think it's the most challenging part of, of parenting, to be honest with you, is trying to understand that world allow your kids to exist on it, but also put enough uh, mm. boundaries in place that you, I suppose, uh, mitigating the chance is going to be something damaging in, the, in mm. the future. Yeah, because it is so new as well. So we're trying to navigate it ourselves yeah. and then we're trying to set the example, monkey see, monkey do. Mm. And like you said, Heinze, it's just the balancing act. You know, uh, segregating screen time and real mm. play time, green time and screen time. So just doing the best that we I can. I like that. Screen time, green time. Well said, uh, Rach. That's it for this week. We hope you liked it. Um, if you can find out more information on today's show <laughs> on the website, go to houseofwellness.com.au. Don't forget to check out the House of Wellness lift out in your local Sunday paper. Nat Bassingthwaite's on the uh, cover, one of my all-time favourites. And tune into our radio show every Sunday. You know everyone's one of my all-time favourites. Yeah, like <laughs> everyone. We're all your best mates. That's right. We love everyone. <laughs> and as always, thanks to our good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. She's your favourite one. I know. I love her. She's a great girl. She's fantastic. <laughs> that and the Sappy Bowl. Share the time for friends.